so this is this event today. If I could have your attention for a moment, so I can introduce our speaker. Uh, this event today is the third in our um, in our seminar series on extreme weather and climate, and this is uh, an activity happening under our Columbia Initiative on Extreme Weather and Climate, and it's this is uh, sponsored. Uh, we we should say by the um, Office of the Executive Vice President for Research at Columbia, uh, which is Mike Purdy, and also the Earth Institute, an important. Uh, important sponsor as well as Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. So this is a, an ongoing uh, uh, university initiative that manifests itself in a number of ways, among which is this um, this seminar series, of which is this is the third. We started doing this just last fall, and this is the third such event. And we're happy to have you all here, uh, Columbia. Uh, faculty, students, and scientists, as well as I believe we have a few people from industry, um, airline industry, insurance industry, uh, and I believe there may even be some New York City government people here, if I'm not mistaken, today. Oh, yeah? Hi. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so, welcome. I don't want to take too much time up here. Um, so, I'll proceed by introducing our speaker. <clears throat> We're very pleased today to have uh, Dr. Rebecca Morse from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where she's a senior scientist and deputy director of the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Laboratory. So her bachelor's degree is from the University of Chicago and her PhD in atmospheric science from MIT, where she and I were classmates. And her research focuses on meteorological and socioeconomic and public policy aspects of weather, including floods, hurricanes, and other hazards. And she's focused in recent years both on uh, the, the science, the physical science of weather, as well as the social dimensions of how people understand it and how people use information, perceive risks, communicate. So she's really unique in her expertise in these two areas and the way she, that she's combined them so fluidly. Um, so I won't list all of her uh, many honors and distinctions, but she's helped to initiate and lead the development of, of a number of US and international efforts to integrate social sciences and meteorological research and applications, including uh, parts of the Thorpex program, which some of you may know what that is, the World Weather Research Program's High Impact Weather Research Project, which is a new initiative going on now, an international uh, activity, and the Vortex Southeast program. And she's a, a well, known and very active on service to the community, including being on a number of national academies committees um, and as an elected member of the council of the AMS. And um, she's currently on the AMS planning commission and nominating committee. So we're very pleased to have her today to talk uh, about how people communicate uh, and interpret the information about extreme weather, including Sandy and others. And so thanks for coming. Welcome, Rebecca. So thank you, Adam. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you to everyone for coming. OK, so I understand we have a diverse audience here. And so if you have questions as I go along, feel free to ask them. Um, what I'm talking about is just a sample of the kind of work that I do. I'll be talking about communication, interpretation, and use of information about extreme weather risks. And um, my, my title says Hurricane Sandy and Beyond, but actually I'll get to Sandy at the end, and I'll start with the beyond. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are more familiar with Hurricane Sandy than I am. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a number of my collaborators. On a number of the projects, I've put the specific collaborators at the bottom of the slides um, so you can see who they are and the different aspects of what I'll be talking about today. But these are some of my main collaborators, particularly Julie DeMuth and Heather Lazarus, who are listed at the top there, are collaborators on a number of the projects I'll talk about today. And then also we have funding from the National Science Foundation and NOAA, um, as well as funding from NCAR. So an overview of my talk, first briefly, I'll talk about the motivation for the kind of work I do and kind of a big picture view of what I do and why, and some background to help you um, frame what I'll talk about today. Then most of the talk I'll spend talking about some of my recent research with a focus on hurricane forecasts and warnings and how members of the public use information. So I do do work um, on different kinds of weather hazards and on longer climate related timescales. We also do some work where we work with weather forecasters and broadcast media and emergency managers and other users of weather forecast information. But today I will just focus mostly in my research that I'll talk about on hurricanes and members of the public, 
but some of the things I'll be talking about are applicable to other kinds of weather and climate communication problems. So I'll talk about three studies. The first one is some interviews I did with coastal Texas residents affected by Hurricane Ike. And I'll just talk about that work briefly as kind of an introduction to the other two projects. And in more detail, I'll talk about a survey we did of coastal Miami residents responding to a hurricane scenario. So that was a hypothetical study where they were given a, a hypothetical scenario and asked how they would respond in an experimental type setting. And then last, I'll talk about some ongoing work where we have a multi-method investigation of decision making as a hurricane approaches and arrives. And then I'll briefly summarize and talk about some of the future work that we're interested in. Okay, so this is kind of a broad overview of the kind of work that I do. So as Adam mentioned, um, my PhD is in atmospheric science. So I bring atmospheric science knowledge and kind of connect with atmospheric science research. So I'm motivated by that and also by the real world challenges of communication and use of weather information. Um, I work on research to help build fundamental knowledge about how people communicate, interpret, and use weather and climate information. And in order to understand that, underlying that, we look at how people perceive and respond to extreme weather risks. And then we use that knowledge to make recommendations for how to improve extreme weather risk communication and reduce harm, and how to think about how to improve communication at a, at a broader level, with really the goal of not just communicating, but also communicating the information in a way that people can use it to help reduce harm. And we do this using theories and methods from multiple social sciences and humanities fields. Um, some of my collaborators are in sociology, economics, anthropology, risk communication, and other fields. So we bring in different kinds of theories and methods depending on the specific problem that we're trying to address. And we integrate that with weather and climate knowledge. So we really kind of try to bring the social science in with the meteorology and the atmospheric science. So. Um, before I go into the, into the main part of my presentation, I wanted to just mention some kind of basic ideas about extreme weather risk communication, interpretation, and use um, to frame my talk. So some of these I'll talk about in more detail as the talk goes along. Um, the first one is that decisions involve many factors along with weather and climate information. Some of you already know this, but for atmospheric scientists, often we think that the weather or the climate information that we provide is the only thing or the most important thing, and often it's not. So that's important to keep in mind, and that's underlying what I'll talk about today. Another important point is that different people interpret information and risk differently. So um, there's a lot of diversity in terms of the information people want, that they can use, that they need, and the kinds of decisions they're making and their perceptions of risk. And so I will talk about that in more detail in my talk today, but that's important to think about that we're trying to communicate with different kinds of publics and different kinds of people. And then another important point is that communication, interpretations, and decisions are complex. So there are all these factors um, happening. They're interactive, so people are interacting within their social networks. It, um, decisions are made in a cultural and social context, so it's not just someone sitting in a room getting information and thinking about it. And then it's all, they're also evolving, so um, all of these processing, processes are evolving over time. So I'll talk about some work to look at that at the end. And so um, one thing that falls out from this is that there's not one best way to communicate or one correct decision. Often we think that if we just get the one right way to communicate information that everyone will understand and they will make the right decision, which in the case of hurricanes would be to evacuate, but that's not the case. Different people will use different kinds of information or they'll understand things in different ways. And then sometimes different people should make different kinds of decisions. So we don't always know what the right answer is. And then the other point is that this may come as a surprise to some of you, but probably not all of you, that most people are not atmospheric scientists. They don't um, necessarily want to know the atmospheric science. They want to know questions like, what does it mean for them? And so here's a quote to illustrate this from one of our studies where we looked at weather forecasters and um, television meteorologists and emergency managers and talked to them about how they communicate hurricane risks. Um, this person who is trained as a meteorologist, but they happen to be a TV broadcaster, talking about how they get information from the National Weather Service. They, he said, sometimes scientists speak like scientists and not like people. So that's the first point. Um, then he went on and talked about some people don't care about the atmospheric science. They don't want to know the terminology. They don't know it. They want to know what it means to them, what does it mean to their family, and what do they need to do. And so don't speak like a meteorologist. Tell me what we need to know. So this is a kind of an encapsulation of even someone who is trained as a meteorologist and his struggles in terms of not speaking like a scientist, but speaking like an actual person. OK, so now I'll go into the main part of my talk, where I'll talk about um, some 
results from recent research on extreme weather risk communication. And as I mentioned, um, most of my talk, I'll focus on hurricane forecasts and warnings, but some of what I'll talk about also applies to other kinds of problems, um, other kinds of weather risk communication, and then also extending into longer time scales, such as climate. And if you have questions about that, you can ask me at the end. So the kinds of research questions that I'll talk about today, um, the first one is how do people respond to different forecast and warning messages? So there's a lot of different messages that come out when an event is approaching and how do people respond to those different kinds of information? And that's important um, for improving communication of risk. So you need to know how people are responding to the information if you want to know how you can do better or where, ways that you're already doing well or not doing so well. A related question is which types of messages help people take appropriate protective action or not? Um, there's a lot of concern whenever a big weather event happens about people that didn't evacuate when they should have or people that don't shelter from a tornado or don't do what we think they should do. And so from that perspective, it's important to understand which types of messages help people understand their risks and evacuate if they should. And there's some kinds of messaging that might not for certain populations. And understanding the whys can help us figure out who we are missing and why. And then related question is, why do p different people respond differently? So there are always these questions about why do we give it this message? And some people did this and some people didn't. And how do we kind of reach those other kinds of people? And so um, I'll talk a little bit about that today. And in the research I'll talk about today, we investigate these questions both in the real world and in simplified contexts. So um, the real world is very complex. There's a lot of things going on. But of course, that's the real world. And so that's how you can really understand decision making and use of information in the full complexity of what actually happens. But it can often be hard to understand kind of the more detailed processes that are going on. So we also do work where we study these um, processes in more simplified contexts. We can kind of abstract out and understand things in more depth and then apply that back to the real world. So when I talk about um, the research results, I'll give a brief example of some real world results that motivated a study in a more simplified context. And then I'll talk at the end about a project where we're doing both together to try to understand this complex system. OK. so. Um, these are this on this slide are some examples of some um, messages and some things that people were saying as Hurricane Sandy approached. So a couple days before Sandy arrived, I pulled these off the internet. Um, there are lots of examples of this, though. So um, if you look at the the um, map in the background, that's the National Hurricane Center cone of uncertainty that's communicating where the landfall is expected to be a couple of days in advance. And then on the top left, you can see an example of a um, message from the National Hurricane Center in one of their forecast products, where this is sort of the scientific way of talking about the storm. The combination of an extremely dangerous storm surge and the tide will cause normally dry areas near the coast to be flooded by, by rising waters. So this is more like scientific speak, although they're trying to talk sort of in, in um, real person language. Um, so there's that kind of message that's out there that some people get. Then there are these other kinds of information. For example, in the media, the storm was called the perfect storm or Frankenstorm or storm or superstorm. And that has meaning to some people or gives them an impression of the storm. Then you have two examples of public officials and the kinds of things that they talked about. One talking about this is the most catastrophic event that we have faced. And then another saying, please evacuate. So um, as I talk about some of my work later, you'll see that these different kinds of messages are communicating different kinds of information. So the meteorologist ones are focusing on where's the storm going to go, what might happen. Um, and then these other messages here, one is talking about catastrophic events. So it's really trying to get people to understand possibly the devastation and take action. And the Barack Obama quote is really just saying, evacuate if you're supposed to. So you're really trying to get people to take action. So here's just one example of a quote from a person um, who was talking about what to do when interviewed before the storm. Um, so this person is really talking about the, what I mentioned before, the diversity of how people understand information and what they decide to do. He says, are people who panic and evacuate, so he's framing the people who evacuate as panickers, kind of a negative point of view, and there are people who have been by the ocean for a long time and they're unfazed by it. So this person wasn't going to evacuate. So these are the kinds of things that people are thinking when they're actually making the decisions given this information. Um, and so you can see kind of the kind of the way that this information is being interpreted if you look at a lot of different kinds of examples of this, which is what I'll talk about next. OK, so first I'll talk about some results from Hurricane Ike, which happened in 2008 and affected the Texas coastline. And this is when I first started doing work in hurricane risk communication. So Hurricane Ike was a large Category 2 storm. Um, it was large geographically. It wasn't that strong in the sense that it was a Category 2, much as Hurricane Sandy was not 
a sort of storm with very strong winds, but it produced a very large storm surge. Um, and this storm surge was predicted a couple days in advance for Galveston, Texas, and the nearby area. Um, and because they were so concerned about the storm surge and that people might not realize it was so potentially devastating, the National Weather Service was worried about people not evacuating. They saw people weren't evacuating in the Galveston area. So they issued a statement that said, persons not heeding evacuation orders and so on and so on will face certain death. And this was really to try to motivate people to evacuate. Now after they issued this first, um, they must have felt like it was a little bit too certain, so they changed it to may face certain death, which <laughs> the meaning of that is really unclear to me. But um, anyway, they were trying to maybe hedge, but also really get people to act. And the Weather Service and also in the media um, is doing a lot more of this type of messaging nowadays. For example, the National Weather Service has a formal program for tornado warnings to now say things like, um, this will be catastrophic, you know, if you're not underground, you may die, and so on. And so there have been some benefits of that, but also some issues that have happened when a lot of people have tried to evacuate at once have gotten stuck in traffic. And so um, we wanted to look at this message and see what people thought about it, especially since I was in Colorado, this was widely reported in the media. So what actually happened in Galveston, these are some pictures that we took after the storm. The one on the left is from the seawall, and you can see that they were actually worried about the Galveston seawall is 17 feet high. They were worried about the water going over the seawall, which it didn't. What happened is the water just came around and went over the back side of the island on the bay, because of course the ocean's all connected, and that, the island got flooded from the other side. So um, a lot of people were flooded, and, and on the right you see a picture of that. So a colleague and I went down to Galveston and did an interview study where we walked around the area and asked people who were repairing their houses or cleaning them out or just around in town um, about what they thought about the storm, why they made their decisions and so on. So I'll, <coughs> sorry, I'll just focus on one, one um, aspect of this study. And that's where we, towards the end of the interview, we asked people about this statement, persons not heeding evacuation orders will face certain death. We asked them if they heard the statement and what they thought about it. So first we asked them if they heard the statement prior to Ike, and if they did, did it affect their decision to prepare or evacuate, and how? So this shows a summary of the results, and again, this is a fairly small study, not that many people, but it was kind of exploratory to get a sense of what we're thinking, and also when you talk to people in person, you can ask them these questions, they really can give you their, their version of the story, they can really tell you in a dynamic sense, what were they thinking when, how did they make decisions, and so on. So about two thirds of the people said they heard the statement, and of the people that heard the statement, they all remembered it very vividly. It really made an impression on them. Um, and of those people who heard it, about a third of them said it affected their decision, the rest of them didn't. So for the people that effect, it affected their decision, they, um, it all helped convince them to evacuate or it helped them convince a family member to evacuate. For the people that it didn't affect their decision, either they weren't gonna evacuate no matter what, and so they didn't, or else they'd already left by the time they heard the statement. So, um, we also asked them what was their opinion of the statement. As I mentioned, people that had heard it almost all had very strong opinions. So about half of them had really positive statements. They said it scared you to death. It helped tell you that if you didn't evacuate, you were going to be in big trouble. And the other half were really negative. They used words like overblown, rude, you know, it was ridiculous. One person told us that it made him not want to evacuate to prove people wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, he actually regretted not having evacuated, but it was mostly because his girlfriend and his daughter spent the whole time screaming and upset. Um, so, but, but you can see that this kind of statement it has benefits. It helped some people evacuate, but it also has its potential negative, um, negative downside. And so um, in the next study I'll talk about, we looked at this in more detail, try to figure out um, uh, kind of how people respond to these kinds of statements, especially because they're being used more in the weather community. And people often think with climate change and other kinds of issues, if you kind of um, scare people and make things dramatic, it might help them know to take action. But there's theories from the social sciences that talk about how people can also have these negative types of responses to this messaging. So we try to look at that a little bit more. But the last point I want to make from this study is that the overall story from this is that many people just didn't adequately prepare for flooding. So it was really um, tragic to walk around town afterwards and see people who either had a two-story two home and their whole first floor was devastated and they hadn't moved things from the first floor to the second floor, or people who had a one-story home and the whole home was flooded. And they said, if only I'd known, if only I'd known it would flood. I would have done something different. I could have taken this thing with me. I could have moved my things upstairs. A lot of them had evacuated and prepared their homes, but they prepared for wind, not for flooding. And so um, this was really um, kind of made a strong impression on me that, that even though Galveston is at high risk from flooding, um, 
the storm surge forecast came out after a lot of people evacuated, and then people just generally didn't even realize this was a major risk. And so what can we kind of do about that, that at least people, you know, to say I never dreamed of seven feet of water and then come back and find everything in your house is gone is, is definitely not a good feeling. Okay, so next I'll talk about the second study um, that I'm gonna talk about today. And in this study, we did a survey of coastal Miami, Florida residents. This is actually part of a larger study. I'll only talk about this component, the survey today. This study also included um, some work where we did focus groups with more vulnerable populations to try to complement our survey. Because when you do a survey, you get sort of the population that responds to your survey, but you don't get a good um, sample of people who might have additional vulnerabilities, such as hard of hearing people, or the elderly, or people who have other disabilities or language issues. In this case, we did implement, this, implement the survey in English and Spanish, and about a quarter of the people responded in Spanish. Of course, that's because it's Miami, where there's a large um, Spanish-speaking population. Um, so, uh, also in this study, we did some interviews with um, we did work with um, emergency managers and broadcast media and forecasters to think about how they communicate. And some of the things we tested in this survey were actually designed with input from the professionals who were trying to communicate. So they brought some of these questions to us and said, we're trying to do this. Can you, can you test for us kind of what happens if we try to communicate in this way? We also developed a survey using um, risk communication theories. I won't talk about that that much today, but it's underlying a lot of what I'll talk about. These different kind of theories from, from other areas like health risk communication and so on that we are trying to apply in the weather context and see if those same um, kind of principles that people have learned from trying to communicate health risk can also apply to weather and climate. Um, anyway, in this survey, we wanted to get people who are all at relatively high risk. So um, in a lot of studies, people will do things like um, take undergraduate students in a you know, behavioral decision lab, or they'll do kind of a, a survey that's kind of of a broad area and ask how people respond to messages. So in this situation, we wanted to take people who really were at high risk, so at least we could say, according to us anyway, all these people should evacuate in this scenario. According to emergency managers, all these people should evacuate because they all live in evacuation zones. And therefore, we're able to kind of ask the question from the perspective of, do they evacuate? Well, they, they, given this situation, they would be at high risk. Um, and it's kind of like, um, they're at, we ask them the question for themselves so they can, at least, that's more realistic even though we're setting this in an idealized context. Um, so our target was the um, red and yellow zones. You see this is Miami, um, Dade County. So those are the areas right along the coast. Um, we did get a few people outside, just outside those zones because of how we targeted the sample. We used a mail recruitment for the sample. So they mailed letters to people who lived in um, zip codes that overlap these zones. But all of our people, all of our respondents are, are right along the coast really at relatively high risk, either in an evacuation zone or just outside one. So, and we had 261 respondents, which is more than the previous study. It's not a huge sample, um, but it's enough to kind of get some initial ideas of how people might respond that can be tested again in future work. Okay, so in order to test the responses to the messages in this survey, we had a scenario um, that you can see on the right-hand side here for a, for a hurricane that was approaching Miami that was developed for us by the National Hurricane Center. And they and the local National Weather Service office developed products like they typically would to go with this scenario. So we had um, different examples of kind of realistic information that weather forecasters would provide. In this case, the, um, the hurricane was heading straight for Miami. So in this scenario, they would, people would see the hurricane was heading straight for Miami and they would all be at high risk. Um, and in the results I'll show today, um, the scenario was about 48 hours before landfall. And so different people received different messages about the same scenario. So we had five different messages and different people received different combinations. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. And this hypothetical scenario was called Hurricane Julia. And after people got this scenario, they were all asked questions about their intent to take different protective actions. I'll focus today on evacuation. So we asked them how likely they were to evacuate given this information, the information they received. And recall, they received different information, but all about the same scenario. We asked them a lot of questions about their perceptions of the risk, their perception of the message, and the source, and so on. And this was to kind of unpack um, some of the theoretical underpinnings for why people were doing what they were doing. Um, as I mentioned earlier. And then we had a number of other questions on the survey on their socio-demographic characteristics, their cultural worldviews that I'll talk about more in a minute, their hurricane experience, and other things that we know are influential in evacuation decision making. So the idea was to see how the messages influenced evacuation decision making, given these other things we already know are true, for example, that some people have evacuation barriers like they don't have a car, or they don't have money, or so on. And so um, 
we kind of included that in the analysis. Even though you won't see it today, I won't show um, those results. That's kind of underlying the analysis. Um, and all of these results are presented in a paper that, um, that just came out, I believe. And we have some other follow-on work that kind of delve into these questions in more detail. OK, so for the hurricane messages tested, all respondents received one of the examples of the cone of uncertainty National Hurricane Center graphic that they developed for us. So you see here the example of the cone with the line, and the Hurricane Center also produces the cone without a center line. And so people received one of the two of those, one graphic. And then these are the other messages they received. And people could either receive or not receive each of these text messages. So they received different combinations of these. You can see the different messages here. Um, one talks about the likelihood of the storm making landfall, so we wanted to test a different way of communicating probability of landfall near Miami-Dade County in addition to um, the cone graphic. The next two messages talk about storm surge. One is kind of a more neutral message about storm surge, about how deep it's going to be. And the next one that I've marked in red here is um, kind of designed after the um, Hurricane Ike, if you don't leave, you may die message. We actually used language from some real um, weather service products in order to develop this. But this was sort of the, what we call the extreme impacts message, like some of the messages the weather community is producing today. And the last message was about evacuation, um, protecting oneself. And this was designed to um, get at people's efficacy, so to help them understand that evacuation was an effective response, because some of the theories indicate that that's important. OK, so in the data analysis, the variables that I'll talk about today, we'll look at, first of all, we'll look at people's likelihood of protect, taking protective action or evacuating, given these different messages. Um, I'll look at negative reactance to messages. As I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of evidence from other contexts to suggest that if you give people these kind of scary messages, some of them react negatively. And we saw that from Hurricane Ike with the statements about the message being rude or overblown or people saying, I don't want to evacuate because of this. I'll talk briefly about cultural worldviews, um, which is a theory, the cultural theory of risk is a theory that we're, we're using because it's been found in other contexts to explain how people respond to risk, and so we're trying to apply it here. And this was, we found this to be important in our study. And then we have these other um, variables that I mentioned earlier. When I show the results, we've done a lot of multiple, multiple linear regressions and other more sophisticated statistical analyses. I won't show the results of those today because they're kind of hard to understand when there's so many variables. Um, but the results I'll talk about are all robust in those kind of multivariate analyses. Um, so I'll use that understanding and I'll kind of present a simpler version of the results. But those, um, that, last, that last bullet at the top where it has sociodemographic characteristics and so on, we controlled for these other variables that we know are important in the analysis. We also have results on those, particularly hurricane experience was one of the most influential variables. People who had evacuated in the past were more li much more likely to evacuate in this scenario, which fits with previous research. But that's a much more complex topic. Um, so I won't talk about that, that today. I'll talk about the first three bullets up there. OK, so this shows the five messages. On the x-axis, you can see the five different messages that um, we gave people. On the y-axis, it shows the mean evacuation likelihood for people that did or did not receive each of these messages. Now recall that people receive different combinations of these messages. So in order to fully tease out what's going on, you have to do a more complex um, Analysis. So what I'll talk about today is kind of informed by the analysis where we look at message interactions and so on. Um, but you can see that um, the two messages that had the strongest influence here were this message about storm surge will be extremely violent and destructive, and if you stay, you may die. Um, so that had the strongest impact by far of the messages. And then the other storm surge message also had an impact. Uh, if you look at the results in more detail, what you see is that either storm surge message had a, had a positive influence on evacuation intentions. Overall, when you put the two together, you actually didn't get much more, you didn't get any more um, likelihood of evacuation. Um, but really, the overall result is that it seemed like communicating storm surge did help convince people to evacuate, especially this dramatic storm surge mes message. OK, so going back to these messages, you can see what they are again. Um, if you look on the left, you can see that the different cones seem to have a different impact. The people who got the cone with the line were more likely to evacuate than people without the line. That fits actually with some previous research, although in our results that was kind of at marginal statistical significance. But another example, if you look at that 55% landfall message, it looks like it has no effect. But actually what happened, um, if you look at these messages in combination, so when we had designed these, we had designed the 55% chance message to communicate the likelihood that the hurricane would strike, which is kind of analogous to the cone on the left. And so we thought that the 55% chance is actually higher than is illustrated by the cone. And we thought that it would increase evacuation intention. That was our hypothesis going in. 
What actually turned out is people didn't seem to interpret the message that way at all. What actually happens is if they got that 55% chance message, they seemed to apply it to these other textual messages. So people that got the 55% chance in combination with these other text messages were less likely to evacuate. So if you look at those other messages um, about storms that are four feet or higher and extremely violent and so on, they look pretty non-uncertain. They look like this is going to happen. So people actually took the 55% chance. They didn't apply it to landfall. They applied it to those. So this is just a, um, there's a lot of emphasis in both the weather and climate communities these days on communicating probabilities. And so it's important to think about whether people are actually going to apply the probability to what you want them to or how it's going to interact with the other kinds of messages. Um, another point um, that came out of our study um, from this message about um, the, the you may die message. So as I mentioned before, people who received this message had a higher likelihood of evacuation. But there's a lot of work from other risk communication areas, and as I mentioned in my, in my Ike study, um, that people who get these messages are also more likely to have kind of a negative reactance response. They become so fearful that they kind of reject the message, and so they say that it's more overblown or something, or they kind of deny the message. And so we also found this in our study. The people who got this message were more likely to evacuate, but they were also more likely to think that the message was overblown and to kind of um, not believe it in that sense. And then they also thought that the source of the message was less reliable. So these kinds of messages, even though they might have a positive influence on, on um, evacuation intention, they might get people's attention, get them to think that the, the event is really risky and do something, it might also have these kind of negative, um, this negative backlash, which we saw in our Ike study among some people. Um, and I want to mention that we have ongoing work testing this with collaborators from Rutgers University. So we're testing this with a larger sample actually in the Northeast US after Hurricane Sandy and asking people um, some follow-on work to try to tease this out in more detail about what kinds of effects the different messages have and what happens if you kind of try to communicate impacts without being overly dramatic and so on. Um, so that's ongoing work. Okay, so also in this study, I, met, I mentioned earlier, um, we wanted to look at why different people respond in the ways that they do. And um, one of the ways we did this was using the cultural theory of risk to look at people's cultural worldviews. So this is the you know, one minute version of the theory, which is actually a much more complicated theory that was developed by political scientists and anthropologists. It's been used in, in uh, especially in the climate context in the meteorology community, community um, but also in a lot of other contexts related to environmental risks. And so it's one theory for that kind of um, explains, tries to explain what people perceive and respond to risk differently. So the idea is that people's cultural beliefs influence their perceptions of and responses to risks. And um, following some work by Lyserowitz et al. in the climate context, we measure two worldviews. Depending on the version of the theory, there's usually four or five, or there's kind of different versions of the theory. But here we just mentioned two. I mean, we measure two. We have different questions to measure them, but I put up here an example of um, the, the, one of the questions that we used to measure each one. So individualism, individualism is the one I'll talk about more. And people who are individualists are people who really strongly agree with things like the government interferes too much in our everyday lives. So you probably know people that you know like this, if you're not a person like that yourself. I mean, actually, thinking back to my Hurricane Ike interviews, I mean, sometimes you could meet people, and they would say they didn't evacuate for reasons like this, basically. The government's telling us what to do. I don't want to evacuate. So that's one reason we were interested in looking at this. And then for egalitarians, this is an example of something egalitarians agree with a lot. Um, the world would be a more peaceful place if its wealth were divided more equally among nations. So these are just examples of these two different worldviews. And the idea from the cultural theory of risk is that people have these worldviews that are informed through their cultural and social interactions. And when they get new information, they kind of see if that information and the recommended action fits with their worldview or not. And so in the climate change context, for example, there's been a lot of work that, that indicates how really whether people believe in climate change or not, and whether they think they should, one should do something about it or not, is strongly correlated with their worldviews and whether the information that people are getting kind of can fit in with their worldview. And if it doesn't, they just reject it and don't believe the information. So we wanted to test this in the hurricane context, specifically for hurricane forecast and warning information. So the theory has mostly been used to look at contested environmental risks, such as climate change, and kind of a hurricane forecast isn't really viewed as a contested, kind of culturally contested risk, but we, what we've seen is that it is um, in the sense that people, the information kind of relates people's worldviews, and so they, they respond to the information in part based on that. 
So um, what this shows um, is that given our Given this, the same survey, on the x-axis you see people's individualism. So we mentioned that, measured this, as I mentioned, using four different um, questions. So this is a sum of that scale, their individualism scale. And you can see the people are distributed along it. The blue dots re uh, represent where people fall in this individualism space compared to their evacuation likelihood, the response they gave to that question. And the size of the dot indicates how many people are in that cell. Um, but the thing to focus on here is the red line, which shows the, the kind of relationship between them. And this also show, um, is shown in our regressions and other analyses that individualism had a really strong effect on evacuation likelihood. So people that were strong individualists were um, two or three points less likely to evacuate on this 11-point scale. So um, respondents with stronger individualist worldviews had lower evacuation intentions. We actually thought that this would interact with the messages that people with stronger individualist worldviews might respond more negatively to this, to this kind of dramatic you will die message because it was kind of um, fearful and kind of suggested coercion or government interference. We didn't find that in our study. Um, there's some signals of it for people with really strong worldviews, but we just don't have enough data to see. But the other um, important point is that individualism actually gave us the strongest survey, strong, strongest signal across our survey. So individualists responded differently to a lot of the survey questions. And in fact, it had a stronger effect across our survey than our messages did themselves. And so people are, you know, um, the messaging can matter, but also kind of the worldview people have or kind of their pre-existing beliefs can be a stronger influence on, um, on what they decide to do. And so individuals were more likely to think that information was overblown. They um, had lower perceptions of the risk. They were less worried about the hypothetical storm. They um, felt less capable to respond. All those things all influenced their likelihood of evacuating. So we have some more research looking at that in more detail, try to understand kind of why these different people are responding differently. Um, and this might be one of the kind of explanatory factors behind why people in the same situation might respond differently to the same information. Okay, so next I'll go to the last study I wanted to talk about today, which is more related to Hurricane Sandy. Um, so, and what I've talked about so far, especially the survey study, what we did is we abstracted from the real world communication context, and we looked at it in a simplified setting. So in the weather and climate community, we often think of people getting some information, forecast warnings, climate change, whatever it is. Some person gets it, they make a decision, and they decide to do something or not do something. And this kind of simplistic view of decision making, which can be really useful to study things like the example I gave in the survey where you can kind of study things in a simplified context and see how people respond to a certain kind of information, but it's not the way that things work in the real world, especially in the modern world. So now today, as a hurricane or other type of weather event approaches, you have evolving forecast information. So 100 years ago, you didn't get a warning. Now people are hearing about the hurricane five or even seven days before the event. They're forming some impressions of the risk based on that and their pre-existing kind of thoughts and so on. The forecasted area of risk covers a larger area in, in, further in advance, usually. And then as the storm gets closer, you kind of usually narrow down the risk area. You get less uncertain information, but you might get different information. And people are updating with the information they receive. So this is really a temporally evolving process. Um, so you can see this, the time axis kind of goes this way. So as the hurricane approaches, people are getting new information. Um, and then, of course, there are lots of different people. Um, the information isn't just coming from the National Hurricane Center or the Weather Service. There's a lot of other forecasters providing information. There's emergency managers. There's people exchanging information with each other. And so even this is a simplified view, of course, but, but you have these social information networks where people are communicating and providing information and kind of sharing things and sharing their impressions of the risk and so on um, that change as the event approaches. Um, and so um, definitely there's been, there, the kind of lead time or ability to provide forecast information further in advance has, has progressed a lot in the last 10 or 20 years. So now you can get information about an event earlier. So this evolution of the forecast information has gotten kind of more um, important in the last few years. Um, 
this, this part about the social information networks, people have always, um, when they got information, kind of looked to other people to interpret the information, whether they're talking to someone in their household or their neighbor, uh, thinking about what the information is, using people to verify information, to decide what to do, and so on. So that's always happened, and there is a kind of small um, thread in the disaster and risk literature that talks about these social processes. But in the last 10 or 20 years, with um, the, the internet and computers, and especially social media, the ways that people are communicating this information has changed dramatically. So you can, people can exchange information a lot more quickly, say on Facebook or, um, or Twitter or something else or, or text or whatever and communicate with people that are further away than they could do in the past when they relied on their neighbors or telephone call or so on. So really the idea is that this is a dynamic system. You have this evol information that's evolving in time. You have people that are getting new information from all these different sources and processing it in, in this kind of social and cultural context. And um, this is getting more complex all the time with things like social media. So we wanted to understand kind of this real dynamic system, which as you can imagine is complex. So. Um, so to examine this, we got a, a grant from the National Science Foundation from their Hazard Seas grant, um, which we call CHIME, Communicating Hazard Information in the Modern Environment. So our overarching question in the study is to ask, how does evolving risk information, so in this case, hurricane forecast and warning information that changes as the storm approaches, how does this interact with societal information flow and decisions as a hurricane approaches and arrives? We're also looking at some other events, but our main focus is on hurricanes. We're asking questions like, what is this dynamic system? So what does this system look like? We don't even have a very good understanding of what it looks like. We want to understand how we can build understanding of the system. So as you can imagine, it's very complex. So we're looking at different methods to build understanding of the system. Um, and then um, in terms of our kind of, one of our end goals is to use this knowledge to think about how we can improve com risk communication and response in today's world where there's complex information exchange and use. Um, so the research is still in progress, but um, it integrates atmospheric sciences, social and behavioral sciences, and computer and information science. So one reason it does this is in the call for proposals. We had to integrate three different disciplinary areas, and so we did that. Um, but also um, bringing in these different disciplines really gives you different perspectives and different tools all in the same project. So that's been a big part of the project is to try to use the tools and perspectives from these different disciplines and different approaches and methods to try to address this complex um, problem. Okay, so the project includes different interconnected research streams and methods, but there's two basic themes. One is modeling of the information system, so this is studying it in a more idealized context where we can kind of, um, kind of control what happens and try to run experiments in a simplified context. So one part of that is hurricane and storm surge modeling to look at predictability of hurricane storm surge. Um, I'll talk about each of these briefly and I'll focus on the Twitter data and the agent-based modeling in a little bit more detail. So also for modeling of the information system, we've built an agent-based model of information flow and protective decisions for hurricane evacuations. Um, and that becomes an experimental laboratory where we can run different tests and say, say, what if the information was like this? What would happen? What if the social network looked like this? What do you go if you go from a no Twitter world to an all Twitter world? Things like that. Are there people that are left behind if, you know, in terms of getting information, if 90% of the people are on Twitter and 10% aren't? Questions like that, or on social media, I should say. And then we also have empirical analysis of the real information system. So then we also are trying to understand the system in its full dynamic complexity, which is obviously very hard to do, and kind of tack back and forth between this more idealized modeling and the real, real system and, and see if we can use that to build understanding. So for the real information system, one of our main tools is analysis of social media data as a hurricane approaches and arrives. And so for doing this, we're working with some colleagues at University of Colorado who have done a lot of work on social media and um, people's communication decisions and kind of crisis management as, an, as a crisis event happens in the aftermath. So they've studied, you know, floods, hurricanes, um, you know, mass emergency events such as terrorist attacks or earthquakes or um, other kinds of disasters um, in the kind of during the event and after the event phase. And we're bringing that expertise from computer and information science and social science to the pre-storm phase, or we're trying to bring it to the pre-storm phase. And then um, we also have some focus groups with more vulnerable populations. So, um, you know, I mentioned this earlier that different people have different constraints. And so, of course, if you're looking at something like Twitter data, you're not getting everyone in the world. You're only getting people who are on Twitter, although they sometimes refer to other people. And so we really wanted to complement that with people who might not be on Twitter or might be disconnected from what we call the modern information environment or kind of today's internet-based communication. 
So we have these um, different methods and we also have some work with stakeholders and other groups to try to uh, make the information more useful. Um, so just briefly um, cover the different aspects of the project to give you an idea of what we're doing. So first is hurricane and storm surge modeling. As I mentioned um, earlier, one of the goals of this is to investigate the predictability of storm surge across a range of lead times. And this is partially motivated by, by what I talked about from Hurricane Ike that um, it's very difficult or it's impossible really to predict storm surge at specific locations more than say 12 or 24 hours in advance because you don't know where the hurricane is going to go. As when there's a lot of uncertainty in the hurricane track, it's very hard to predict storm surge at specific points because it's so kind of locationally specific. And so the Hurricane Center and the Weather Service are really loath to do that because say three days in advance, the probability of a storm surge at any given location is really low. So we're trying to ask a different question and say, okay, at those longer lead times, say three or four days, what could you predict about storm surge. So you can at least try to give people more information so they don't have the situation where they've evacuated before they've even heard about the concept. Um, and so um, that's one of our foci. And then the other um, reason we're doing this is to provide input to the agent-based model. So we're, we're coupling in an offline sense the hurricane and storm surge modeling and the agent-based modeling to investigate how different how information propagates through the societal system with the idea that eventually this become a much larger coupled system, coupled model system so you can investigate kind of, you know, predictability issues and uncertainty propagation and, and information propagation and so on through this coupled physical societal system. So we're doing that with the ad circ model. Um, right now we're doing simulations of surge using the best track data from what's actually happening and perturbing that in different ways. And then we're gonna move forward um, once we kind of understand what ha what's happening in that context to high resolution ensemble predictions. So that's the hurricane storm surge modeling. Next I'll talk briefly about the agent-based modeling. So the idea of this is to have a virtual simplified laboratory where we can explore the interactions among hurricane information, information networks, and decisions. So um, this model was built by some colleagues at Arizona State University with us. And we're using knowledge from the atmospheric science and also from the social sciences to build a model in a way that that goal isn't to represent real decisions because you can't really do that with social modeling, but to represent the processes in a simple way that is somewhat realistic or at least has similarities to the real world where you can test out these kind of complex behaviors that happen when you have these agents in interaction. So um, what the model does is it models social actors who pursue, process, and transmit information and make protective decisions. We do have forecasters, we have emergency managers, and we have broadcast media in the model, but they're very simplistic at this point, and most of the focus is on the public agents who are exchanging information and getting information from different, different sources and deciding whether it's risky enough to evacuate or um, take other protective action. In this model, they don't actually move anywhere. There has been um, some work on agent-based modeling for, for modeling actual evacuations, like after people start decide to evacuate and they're driving on roads and kind of for traffic routing and, and so on. Here we're focusing on the information exchange and the decision making, not what they actually do. Um, and as I mentioned, the model use, utilizes knowledge from atmospheric and social sciences. So if it works, I'm going to show a brief video uh, version one of our agent-based model. So the black lines represent the cone of uncertainty around the, the storm. You can see in Florida, you can see the hurricane approach and you can see those different dots or different kinds of agents and as they change colors, they're deciding to do different things. Um, so we're in the process of kind of doing some more sophisticated evaluations of what people are doing, but you can see in this as the hurricane approaches, you see people kind of deciding what to do and um, the oranges are people who evacuate. So as you'd expect, um, you see more people that are close to the path of the storm evacuating. Um, and so we're looking at different diagnostics to kind of understand how different kinds of information and different kinds of storms, prop information about them propagate to the system and how it influences people's decisions. And um, we can also compare with real events, at least at some level, to show that we're getting um, kind of, that at least we're simulating behaviors that are related to the real world. So for example, if we get most people evacuating over the panhandle of Florida and not where the hurricane approached or, and arrived, then we would know we had an issue. Um, so that's something we're working on. And I think it'll be an important tool for, for examining decision making um, in a kind of more idealized setting. So next I'll talk a little bit more about our social media data analysis. Um, so in this work, um, as I mentioned, we have colleagues who have expertise in Twitter data analysis, and um, we're bringing that to the pre-storm phase. So the goal is to use Twitter data streams to explore people's evolving information use, risk assessments, and decisions as they occurred in their real-world context. So on Twitter, 
uh, we get um, intermittent snapshots of what people, people are thinking. Actually, some of it's not in real time. Sometimes they reflect afterwards on what they were doing before, but often it is what they're thinking in real time. So they say, I'm worried, or they're talking to someone, or they're saying, I got this information, and so on. So, um, but you don't get their, what they're thinking at all points in time. You just get their snapshots that they choose to provide. Um, and it's big, messy data. So as um, indicated in the bottom, um, the data set that we're using right now is for, from Hurricane Sandy. Um, so our colleagues at the University of Colorado, as the storm was approaching, about five days in advance, we were just starting to talk to them. And we said, hey, there's a storm coming. It might affect the East Coast. Why don't you gather data and see what happens? Because it's much easier to gather this data in real time. So they gathered about 16 million tweets with, um, that had Hurricane Sandy keywords. And that um, is about 8 million Twitterers. That's a lot of data. Um, and what we are also doing, as you'll see in a minute, is we're, we're gathering what we call their contextual tweets. So we're trying to pick out users of interest, and then we gather all of their tweets, not, the, not just the ones that, where they mentioned Sandy, because as you'll see in a minute, when I show examples, um, there's a lot of information in their tweets where they don't specifically mention a hurricane. That's where you get a lot of what they're thinking about and kind of see that evolve with time. So there's a lot of data, and it's all complicated worded data. There's a lot of misspellings and, and colloquial language and images and all kinds of things. So it's big, messy data. And there are a lot of other groups that are kind of using the same kind of data, but um, it's really hard to find what we call the signal in the noise. So a lot of it comes down to hand analysis of tweets, because um, there aren't that good of aut automated algorithms to do the kinds of things we're wanting to do. Our colleagues at University of Colorado are using um, kind of more sophisticated analysis techniques with linguistics and other kinds of things with the metadata to try to tease out some of the things that we want to do, but it's more complex than anything they've done before. So we're still in the initial stages. But um, the area I'll focus in on today is Far Rockaway, um, which was under an evacuation order, and there was a lot of damage in that area. Um, and we're looking at, so what I'll, so what we've done, we, initially, we thought that if you looked at geotag data, you would get a good data set of people who were in affected areas. You can look at people who were geotagged at some point in an area that was highly affected or should have been evacuated and um, look at those people. Um, there are some problems with that. The biggest one is that only about 1% of tweets are geotagged. Um, so, and it also is also hard to find where people actually live because they're moving around, especially in an event like this and in New York City. Um, but you would think, of course, that with 1% of tweets geotagged, you would still find good people. What hap the issue is actually, the bigger issue is that the geotagged people, at least based on what we've seen, tend to be sort of younger and um, Le less often making decisions for themselves. So they're talking about their parents, they're talking about school, they're not really deciding whether to evacuate themselves and, and processing the risk in as deep of a way. And so when you just look at the geotag tweets, you really get, a, you get some overlap with the kind of people we're looking for, but you get a lot more just like jokes and not really caring that much about the storm and just saying my parents said this, so we're gonna do this. Um, and a lot more inanity and profanity. Um, <laughs> I just, I was at a talk recently where someone was talking about, you know, all the profanity, talking about Hurricane Sandy and Twitter data, and that's definitely true, um, but you, de you see it more when you look at the geotag tweet. So we define another way to enter the data space. So what we did is we looked at people who, um, who mentioned certain neighborhoods that were highly affected, and as I'll talk in a minute, um, we also did focus groups. And so Far Rockaway was one of the areas where we did these focus groups, and so um, we collected data about people who mentioned Far Rockaway and Hurricane Sandy. And then from that, we selected the people who actually were in Far Rockaway, and we looked at them in more detail. And so the idea behind this is to do hand analysis of this data, and then we're coupling this with this, um, li these linguistics colleagues that are doing sort of this automated analysis to try to figure out what we're looking for so we can find it in this 16 million or larger data set of um, tweets. So I'll give just briefly two examples of people um, that, um, that we have in this Twitter data set. Um, both of these people kind of are tuned to the risk pretty far in advance compared to our larger data sets. You can see this first person, their first Hurricane Sandy tweet is on October 26th. Um, so this person is a longer term res resident who ends up evacuating. We know this actually from their Twitter stream, the things that they say. Um, so when you read the whole stream, you can often find out what the person did and kind of their characteristics. So you can see um, there's this first phase where the person just becomes aware of the storm. And on October 26th, she makes this interesting statement. She's, the at mentions are um, talking to someone else. She's talking to this person at AA, whose name I've removed for now. Um, 
a bunch through the storm. So it's kind of like she's texting back and forth using Twitter. Um, she said, you know Far Rock the first to go. So she's saying she, are, she knows that she lives in a vulnerable location if Hurricane Sandy comes. Um, then a couple days later, she's talking to this person and say, I'm worried, I couldn't sleep. So that's kind of a response to the risk here. She's, she's starting to process it. The E marks when the evacuation order comes out. And then after that comes out, she says, the beach is one block away from me and I'm staying home. Pray for me, y'all. So she's saying, I'm not evacuating. And then she goes out to the ocean and she, she actually, um, we can't, I didn't put this in, but she shows a picture. She says, the water really look a lot of these waves. Hurricane Sandy, I'm out here. She's out on the ocean, like saying, I'm here. And then she doesn't tell us when, but sometime in this period, she evacuates. She tells us, yeah, we're at my grandma's house, good old project building her and keep us safe. And she posts a picture of flooding that presumably she took somewhere during that period on her way out. So this is an example of someone, you can see some of the dynamics of their decision. They become aware of the event, they become worried about it, but they say, hey, I'm not doing anything, even though there's an evacuation order. You know, and then um, she goes out and looks at the water and then decides to leave. And she evacuates to a, to a relative's house. So here's another example. Um, this is of a new resident. We know this because he tells us in here he hasn't lived through a previous storm and moved to this area about a, a, week, a year ago. He ends up not evacuating. This ha person actually has a lot of tweets, so I'm just extracting a few. And this is one of the people who's actually talks the most about weather forecast information. Interestingly, almost no one talks about weather forecast information, although you can tell that they're referring to it um, or they're, they're aware of it because some of the things they say mean that they've gotten a forecast, but they hardly ever actually mention it. This is an example of someone who actually does mention it. Um, so on October 25th, he says, okay, there's Sandy, it's coming. That's his first Sandy tweet. Tweets a lot more about it. Um, on October 26th, he says, I'm off aware and on alert for Sandy. So he is kind of thinking about the risk more. And then he says, I'll be live tweeting photos and video. So he's kind of trying to get publicity throughout this, his tweet stream. You see him kind of vacillating between this like risk awareness and trying to get attention for his live stream. He says, watch me drown in real time. There's a lot of joking going on here. And this guy himself actually flips back and forth between joking and being mad at other people that make jokes. But um, humor. <laughs> Humor is a way that a lot of people cope with the risk, and you can see that. Um, okay, so then um, later that day, he says to someone, hey, I'm two city blocks from the beach. I'm a little worried. So he expresses worry compared to being excited about drowning in real time. Um, and then um, he kind of makes this awareness of storm surge risk. Not many people talk about storm surge, but he says there's storm surge. So it shows that he's become aware of this possible risk of flooding where he is. Does that mean there's a chance of sharks in the street? Serious question. So it's kind of a joke, but he's really saying he's worried and he's aware of this risk. And this kind of goes on um, through the storm. And the next day, you know, as he's doing this, you know, people are tweeting back and saying, hey, dude, why don't you leave? And he says, I'm worried about wind blowing through a window. So here he flips back to wind rather than storm surge. So he's kind of thinking about the different kinds of risks. And then um, later that day, he gets, a, um, he gets information from a broadcaster. And he talks about Mayor Bloomberg's press briefing. And it says, storm surge may reach eight feet with 10 to 20 foot waves on top. Rockaways are set for major flooding. He tweets right back and says, I'm two blocks from the beach. Define major flooding, please. So to us, it seems like eight feet with 10 to 20 feet on top seems like they've defined major flooding. But for him, he just is trying to say, what does this mean to me? Um, and as you go on, he you know, sets up his video camera. They prepare their house for wind. He has a lot of dogs, including special needs dogs, so he doesn't evacuate. And then you see this period um, as the storm makes landfall where the, um, his house starts to get flooded, his first floor. And then you see this series of tweets at the bottom where you see a garage is flooded and then he, um, three tweets in a row or more where he you know, says the F word and posts pictures. So it's like, this is like the oh crap. Like you see the realization of this is actually happening, this risk that he's talked about for three or four days in advance and evaluated, then it actually happens and he's really angry about it and really surprised. And so this is the kind of thing that Twitter data can provide potentially that other kinds of data sources can't do as well is what are people thinking about in real time and how do they process the risk. Okay, so we're analyzing this Twitter data to investigate a lot of different things. The analysis is ongoing. How the dynamics of risk perception and protective decision making in particular, roles of social networks, use of information, use of information, um, vulnerability and adaptive capacity, how social media affects all these processes, and so on. So that is all in process. As you can imagine, it's kind of challenging to tease out these different things with these dynamic situations and different people, but we're, that's what we're doing. 
Okay, so last I'll just mention these focus groups that we're doing. And um, with this, um, this really, uh, one of the central questions in our, in our um, project is how does communication of risk alleviate or exacerbate vulnerability as a hurricane approaches and arrives? And so we're really looking at risk communication as a form of adaptive capacity, which um, hasn't been done as much in the literature. There's a lot of talk about adaptive capacity, but we're trying to really link it to the risk communication literature. So we're looking at roles of adaptive capacity and vulnerabilities in the context of the modern information system, meaning people who are or are not um, more connected to the internet and so on, because these are important questions. It's much easier to look at people who are on Twitter because they're giving you their data data than people who aren't, who might be disconnected. But these people are probably the most important to think about. So um, my colleagues, um, Heather Lazarus, Alexa Dietrich, um, Jen Henderson, and Olga Wilhelmi, who forgot to put on the bottom of the slide, um, and I did focus groups in five neighborhoods post Sandy um, in different languages. Um, we, we picked specific kinds of vulnerable populations like um, non-English speaking, elderly, people who live in public housing and so on to try to, try to both try to understand these research questions on their own and then also contextualize the, the Twitter analysis. And so the data analysis is still in progress in part because it's in different languages and we had to get it all translated because no one speaks all three languages. Um, but um, of course, anyone who does vulnerability work knows this, that there's complex intersecting factors that influence sandy information access and decisions. But we're trying to kind of understand that in more depth. And um, there's a lot of subtleties. For example, on the right here, we see two different kinds of housing in Far Rockaway. Um, sort of on the face of it, you might think that people who live in public housing are more vulnerable in some ways because they might be lower income and so on. But actually, in some ways, in some situations, they're, they're um, less vulnerable because at least they're getting information um, from some sort of organized source, although that a lot of that depends on who lives in their building. So people that kind of speak the same language and are from the same culture as others in their building kind of felt like they had a bigger social network and felt safer leaving their stuff behind than people who um, who uh, live in housing that don't understand their neighbors. They felt more at risk. So there are all these subtleties. Um, for the Spanish-speaking focus groups, we did one with a group that is Puerto Ricans mostly who live in public housing and another with undocumented immigrants. And there's a lot of differences um, between them, um, both in terms of you know, citizenship and documentation and all kinds of things. So there are all these subtleties that we're kind of trying to tease out. OK, so to summarize, um, first is that how information is communicated matters. Um, Accurate information does not on its own reduce harm from extreme weather. Um, for the atmospheric scientists in the audience, we love to provide better scientific information. That can be very important, but there's also this other piece of the question. And understanding how people might interpret and use information, um, as I mentioned a little bit with the uh, um, hurricane storm surge predictability study, can also inform new scientific questions, physical science questions. And so um, in order to help improve communication use of information about extreme weather risks, the kind of work that I do is really to build fund fundamental understanding about how different people in different situations think about weather risks, how they interpret different types of information, and how they make decisions um, about management of those risks or don't make those decisions. And so moving forward, um, as I talked about in the last part of my talk, um, I think it's really important and interesting to try to integrate physical and social sciences to learn how creation and communication of information works and how to improve it. And especially to do that given the dynamic, interactive, and increasingly complex ways in which people are communicating and using information. It's very hard to understand this system, but we're far from the world where, you know, someone issues a siren and people decide what to do. There's information everywhere. People can go check the internet, their phones, social media, and everything before deciding what to do. And then as I also mentioned, um, I think one tool for doing that is to combine investigations that, that ask these questions in simplified context with real world analyses using different kinds of methods and approaches from different disciplinary backgrounds and different kinds of data can give you different kinds of information. And so we're trying to work on that and I think that's a really valuable way um, to go moving forward. So. This diagram on the right, you know, we often think about this is an ensemble prediction of Hurricane Sandy as the storm approaches. We often think about providing the scientific information, and then people are going to do something with that. Um, they, or they kind of and get information about the impacts. So if we could just tell them what was going to happen, then, then, um, then they would do something. But it's also really important to understand what people are thinking about the risk and um, how they're interacting with other, each other in order to inform the scientific information that's produced so we can provide better information about the impacts. So I will close there and take any questions.
there's a microphone, so I guess if you raise your hand, if you have a question, I can give you the microphone. Yes. So, anyone who's, I mean, you've seen plenty of times perusing social media with a storm approaching. We've seen it plenty of times here in New York and elsewhere. It's a mess of information. A lot yeah. of it's miscommunication. Communication. Right. A lot of it's misinformation and. Amongst that, there's also a lot of good information. So mm -hmm. do we, as a, a weather, uh, and at times a climate community, do we have a responsibility to try and help in that process? Or is this something that needs to be guided by a series of proactive individuals or by a larger source within our science communities that can help kind of drive a, uh, a better understanding? Yeah, that's a really good question. and. Um, you know, we don't know the answer to that yet. I will say that our colleagues who work in this area, they have worked with emergency managers in the past to try to help them figure out when to intervene when there's misinformation during a mass emergency event. So um, people don't respond that well often to someone coming in and saying all the time, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. The key is kind of when is the conversation going far enough awry that you want to correct it. And in their case, they have a public safety reason for doing that. Um, so there are kind of tools now where they, they can try to kind of change the conversation. The issue, one issue with that, of course, is that the conversation often happens so fast and it's hard enough to understand it that, um, especially at the levels we're talking about, about what misinformation is. I mean, you can use automated sentiment analysis to figure out are people happy or sad or, you know, but, but as you saw in those tweet streams, I, I point out a lot of the information doesn't use the keywords you think. There's a lot of misspellings. There's one guy who spells hurricane with a K the whole time. You're going to totally miss people like that. Or they just don't even refer to the hurricane um, when they're saying the things that are misinformation. Um, so that becomes really complicated. Um, I will say in the weather community, um, when there's an event approaching now, we try to collect data as the event is approaching. And so we look at the, the tweet streams where people are talking about the data. And um, we haven't analyzed this quantitatively, but my impression is that the conversation in the weather community is often very separate from the other conversations. So there are meteorologists who are saying a lot of stuff, and mostly they're tweeting back and forth to each other. Sometimes there's one person that kind of gets picked up in the broader stream. But um, at least in, say, if you talk to the National Weather Service, I think they seriously overestimate their ability to shift the conversation. Um, and so people are really trying to figure out how to do that, how to engage in the space in a way that's, li that's listened to. I think that somehow you have to have people who are brokers who already have the following. I mean, there are people who gain a lot of following during, during event, particularly if they provide useful kind of local information. But there's also a lot of people who gain a following by making fun of Mayor Bloomberg talking in Spanish. So people can start like an account and get a lot big following, but often, you know, they don't have any better information than other people. So. Um, so yeah, it's a big open question. I think um, what, what I'm really thinking about is that the way we think about information, communication, we think, OK, we're communicating information. We have this expertise. There's a social media world. People are listening to it. We're going to try to communicate information better. But when you talk to our colleagues who work in this area, the way they think about it is that people are changing how they communicate faster than we can even know what it is. So you kind of view it as this kind of self-evolving system or evolving system that you can't ever really fully understand. So it's not like you're trying to understand it and keep up with it and then intervene. You're just trying to say, we have this kind of, people have this capacity to provide new information that we've never even thought of, so how do we utilize that, if that makes sense? And so really to just accept there's this complex, ever-changing system and figure out how do you, how do you kind of play in with that and knowing that it's gonna change and knowing that as soon as you figure out the answer, the answer will have been what was useful two years ago and some you know, teenager and wherever will have figured out something better that you have to address. Um, so just sort of a follow up, I, I went to a talk once on, um, on, I guess it was more on earthquakes and how mm -hmm. information is transmitted. And they were talking about how you end up with members of the community that sort of end up being like little nuclei for information. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible, and those are not necessarily the NWS, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to try to kind of target those types of people who might end up being actually like celebrities or people who have no kind of um, relation to the weather, but kind of, um, targeting certain people and giving them accurate information so they can become disseminators. Is that something that is a 
part of the field of um, I think that's definitely possible. I think we're still trying to kind of figure this out. I think the kind of work you're talking about usually with an earthquake, it's during the event and afterwards, or there's kind of a more um, focused population in a way because people are, con it's happening to them. They're trying to get information that way. Um, so our colleagues have worked some in that space. I think before the before the um, situation happens, the much more dy dynamic fluid space, we, we see when an event happens is that people sort of, in after the after the event, they they tend to flock, people build new networks, so they flock to certain kinds of people that are providing certain kinds of information. And I think as the situation's evolving beforehand, it's a little bit more complicated, but, but what our colleagues have found is say, if you look at the most retweeted tweet prior to Hurricane Sandy, Sandy it was something from Justin Bieber, like, hey, be safe, y'all. And um, so that's the most retweeted tweet, but it's sort of contentless if for our purposes. And there's tweets that never get retweeted at all. And then there's this sweet spot in between. That's people who are local and providing local information to their community. And those get retweeted a lot, and those people's networks grow. So it's something about those people who are kind of local. Like So in the Sandy case, it would be people that are might be local to a neighborhood or something like that. They have particular traction in that neighborhood, or they already have some existing local network, and they're able to provide locally relevant information. So it's essentially becomes a bunch of people, like um, say if you, you know, people cite Hurricane Katrina churches were important community resource in some areas for getting out information and for helping people evacuate and so on. So this is basically the same thing in the Twitter world, but the complexity of it is that you have to do that in a lot of different places because there's not one, one person or five people. Um, but I, I will say that we, we haven't looked at this yet in much detail, but we're hoping to, that you can see there's kind of a couple different worlds. There's people that are really engaged in terms of emergency management information. They watch the mayor. They talk about the evacuation orders. And so for those people, they're using kind of traditional channels also. And then there's people who are just not. And so if you kind of think about it that way, then in order to kind of um, correct misinformation or um, reach people who are who are uh, maybe not not up to date or so on. Maybe you only have to kind of target the people who aren't in the kind of official information stream, if that makes sense. Because those people at least hopefully are getting the best information available. But the idea is that really you have to kind of, and you, and, and you can build analysis tools to do that, to dynamically see who's gaining, well, the issue is that followers aren't as important anymore, but kind of who's gaining traction in real time and maybe use those people. Um, it's a possibility, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, um, oh, I should use a mic. Can you talk a little bit about um, probability? So those of us who are in the field, I think, have the perception that forecasts should all be probabilistic. The information, that's how it is. That's what we should provide. But it's my perception that forecasters who actually have to do the job of communicating to the public are mm -hmm. hesitant to make things as probabilistic as they could be because they think people won't get it. So examples are, we had this big snowstorm a couple of years ago here that didn't happen and people were upset, but the Weather Service knew it might not happen. You could, it was buried in some web page somewhere, but there's a hesitant to give people probabilities. And this seems like an issue that will never go away and in some ways it even becomes more important. As you said, people go to longer lead times. That information is very uncertain, but there's some skill there, so there, it should be communicated, but there seems to be a a preference for giving a narrative, you know, r regardless, even if it might be wrong, to better to give a narrative that. So, how does that? I mean, you, you're the little that you talked about it. You seem to be indicating that people don't, when you give people probabilities, it does confuse them. But do you conclude then that it's better to just make your best guess and say that, even if it's you know, 55 percent, you know, probability of different than average or something? Or what's the right way to think about that? Well, it's interesting you ask that because that's the whole section of my talk that I cut out in order to save time. Um, so I have studied this kind of issue and um, I think a couple things. The first thing is that we think that sometimes people don't understand the uncertainty in the information and the, the um, kind of work we've done indicates that at least in weather forecasts, people know they're uncertain and they don't believe the actual numbers, so they're already inferring some sort of probability. It's just they're all inferring different probabilities. Um, we also think that people need to understand the information in order to use it, and that's not always true. People can people seem to like and can use information that they don't understand the technical definition of. So I think in, um, at least in the communities that I've talked to, like the weather community, they focus a lot on, can people understand the probability? Do they know what we mean? And I think that focus is kind of, um, 
maybe it's, it's useful, but it's more important to under, figure out if people can use it well enough to, um, to make something useful out of it. Like probability of precipitation is an example that people have got, information people have gotten for 30 years. No one actually really understands it, but a lot of people use it because they know that 70% is more than 40% and they've seen it a million times. Um, I think in terms of probabilistic communication, um, I think that for the physical scientists, probabilities are really important. And for some users, they can and will use that information. I think there are two issues. One is probabilities of what? And so often when we produce probabilistic information as atmospheric scientists, we produce them of atmospheric science quantities. We do a map of something at a specific point. And say with storm surge risk communication, um, that's the way the National Weather Service has gone. They, they say, okay, people don't understand the storm surge risk. We're going to produce these maps where they can see with a color that they have a 1% you know, or 5% chance of storm surge over seven feet at this location. And one issue with that is that as you go further back in time, the probabilities get really low. And so uh, there's a different question, which is, is there any storm surge risk at all? And you can think about the probability of that as you go to longer lead times. So, the idea is that basically as an event kind of evolves, you can provide probabilities about different kinds of things based on what your predictive skill is. Um, and I think the other issue and the reason for narratives is that fundamentally the way people make most decisions is not using probabilities. If you're approaching a traffic light and you see it turn yellow, you're not calculating the n amount of time before it's going to turn red, your speed, the likelihood a car is going to come the other way, this intersection, and so on. You're just making a gut decision. And um, you can see, I mean, that example I showed of the one Twitter user was actually very engaged with, with um, with scientific information as Sandy approached. He was looking at forecasts. He was comparing forecasts from different forecasters. Um, he has a capability to process complex information, but he still is, is processing the risk in this sort of intuitive sense. And there's a lot of kind of work on how and why people do that. So I think that um, in my point of view, I think from my point of view, probabilities can be useful. I just think that um, often the approach that atmospheric scientists take is when we can only get people to understand the probabilities are, use, are useful, then they'll use them. And I think it's going to be quicker to modify the information that we're providing in a way that is closer to the space that they're using it, whether it's probabilities of something else or it's not always probabilistic, then it is going to be to change the human brain in the way that it works and makes decisions. So if I could ask a follow-up. The, the, the follow-up is, I guess, to make it more specific. What's the right way to communicate? This is a thing, something that's happening a lot uh, these days. The, when the forecast information says that there's a low but not trivial risk of something significant happening, you know, relatively far out, mm -hmm. right? That's more and more, we see that flying around Twitter and stuff. So what's the right way to communicate that given all these? Yeah, so we don't know the answer to that question, but I think there, the, some of the useful information is scenario-based. It can be probabilities or not. So for example, I mean, I wasn't here, but we have looked at the communication of that snowstorm where there was a big bust, and the real issue there was the rain snow line, right? There, they knew there was going to be snow, just not where. And so if you focus on the amount at a location, then that doesn't give people the kind of geographic context to understand the information. And so, um, for example, what we're looking at, and we don't know if it'll be useful, but we're going to try and see with the storm surge risk communication is that three days in advance, you can't tell where there's going to be storm surge. What you can say is, for this storm, there's likely to be a high storm surge, and we don't know exactly where, but as the storm approaches, you'll get better information once we know the track. And so, you might be able to provide probabilities that there will be a large storm surge, but not at a location. Or, so it's, I think a lot of it then is about the probability of what. So you can say, some, and also some of that communicating certainty. So we know there's going to be snow. We don't know exactly where. And then you can communicate around that. What, you know, this is a way to communicate the probability of you know, the location changing or kind of have one area where you're like, OK, here we know it's going to snow. We just don't know how much within this range. And here we know it's not going to snow, right? But there's some place in the middle where it's going to precipitate. We just don't know exactly what kind and, and kind of focus the probabilistic communication in that sense. Because we tend to think of like numbers on a map, and people live in an integrated over time and space world. Um, 
first of all, I think a lot of these decisions are driven by emotional factors rather than logic, and I'm sure you're aware of that. But, but you've been mentioning risk a great deal, idea of reward. Most people make decisions, I think, based on a risk to reward ratio. Uh, it might be subconscious or whatever. Have you t talked to people that decided to, s to, to stay and why, what they felt perceived as the reward for staying? And, and what about also people that did stay and got really screwed up? How about, how do they regard their, their initial assessment of reward? You know? So it might be another way of approaching it. Yeah, that's a good point, and that's definitely true when you talk to people that did or didn't evacuate. I mean, we've talked. I talked to someone once who, whenever there's a um, hurricane approaching, they just fly to Las Vegas because it's a good opportunity for a vacation, so they just get out really early, um, and that's kind of their their reward. Basically, that's the way they cope with it. Um, I've talked to people who did stay in situations that seemed to me quite alarming. Um, if I were like a 75-year-old man and there was a uh, my big screen TV was floating in four feet of the in water, and I was thinking about whether to get an ax to chop through my ceiling like people did in Katrina, like that would seem not good to me, but people think it's, like, it's exciting, like they think it's fun, and they think it's a big adventure, and that's huge. Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, so that sort of suggests the entertainment value, I guess, of the reward of that, of, of staying or evacuating. Um, Interestingly, in the focus groups that we did when our co my colleagues did the Russian-speaking focus groups um, in New York City after Hurricane Sandy, this is the first time we've ever seen something like this, is basically for everybody that evacuated in that focus group, they said the experience was so bad they would do the opposite again. They thought that the people who stayed were better off. And for everyone that stayed, they thought the evacuees were better off and they would do the other thing next time. So usually people do the same thing again, but there's this very, like when you do something and it doesn't go well, then, then people kind of switch. But there's definitely, um, for people that are doing certain things, for some of them it is kind of a, right, they're making the decision based on what the benefit is. Some people really like to like after a storm happens and they have a week without power to like cook on their hibachi and get, gather all the steaks in the neighborhood and cook for everyone and they, they enjoy that. I remember uh, we visited the site of Hurricane Field two years after that. I I remember reading that people actually had parties, hurricane parties, they were going to have a real great ball on travel. Nobody they thought this risk was really exciting. Yeah, definitely. I didn't mention that aspect of the Twitter data, but we do see actually one of the most common things that people do to prepare is get get um, alcohol and other other supplies, things you probably shouldn't tweet about, but they do. Um, and um, some people actually moved up their Halloween parties. We see several people who had a Halloween party early because they knew that um, Sandy was coming and after Halloween wouldn't be such a good time. Um, and so they moved the party early. Of course, they didn't really fully conceptualize the risk, but, but um, you know, there definitely is that. And they, people use um, Sandy as an opportunity to get together with family um, or a hurricane, you know, get together with family and they, they cook and they hang out at home and have parties and, and all kinds of things. So yeah, there's kind of the basic, I guess, human, the way human nature works. Jack? Yeah, I, I guess earlier, um, yeah, so, so in the first half of the talk, you were emphasizing a lot how, you know, d different social groups or people with different worldviews would take the same message very differently. So I guess what concrete advice do you have for communicators for communicating in that environment, right? Should you sort of make multiple messages and target them to different neighborhoods or cities where people have different worldviews or come from different socioeconomic classes? Or should you just try to say something that's general enough that it'll appeal to people across these worldviews? Or is it, am I just thinking about it the wrong way completely? No, I think those all make sense. I mean, from our work, the, the work in understanding worldview in the hurricane context is still, as, as far as I know, we're the only ones who have actually studied the influence um, in hurricane risk communication as the storm approaches, and so we just don't have that much information yet. But there has been work in other contexts, particularly in climate change, about this. And I think one thing from the hurricane context, what you don't want to do is produce an, a message that is going to really turn off a lot of people. So if you know that some message is going to have a really strong backlash for some people with no real benefit or no strong benefit for other people, then that's not a great idea. Um, I think. Um, in the climate literature, there's different ways to do it. One is to in, have different kinds of messages where you appeal to different people's world, world views. So a lot of it becomes about the solution. So people agree with different kinds of solutions. So people with some kinds of world views like taxes more, other people like, um, you know, they don't like the word tax, that's a real negative. So they have other kinds of language you can use to really talk about the same thing. 
Um, so some of it's that, and some of it's also about the communicator. So people um, respond to messages better, more from someone from their same worldview, and they get they can infer that by looking at them. They can infer that because they know them. They're a Fox News anchor versus you know an NPR person. They might know the person, or there might be a judgment they make based on the language about whether that person kind of fits their worldview. So the worldview interpretation is kind of in a cultural context. So people are really, it's not like you're just listening to the message, you're really responding to the person and, and their worldview as much as um, you're responding to the information in it. So there's something about the messaging, but there's also something about the messenger. And both are important. Oh, yeah. That in general, in the, for the first half of the talk, you kept sort of repeating about how different people were going to take the same message very different. I'm not even talking about the KN culture we're using so much. Yeah, yeah. Just in general, how do you deal with that whether this communicator if you know that different individuals are going to have really different reactions? Yeah, I don't, well, like I said, yeah, yeah, we don't know the answer to that yet, but I think that, like I, I said initially, I mean, you, you want to have some message, right? If you're the National Weather Service, you're communicating to everyone. So you have some message, and you want to pick a message that's not going to offend certain people or totally miss them, and then you have to figure out what to do about the rest of the people. And the rest of the people have different mechanisms based on who they are. And then I think um, then some of it might be public messaging and some of it might be targeted messaging. And in real her weather situations, you see this. I mean, emergency managers will go out to certain neighborhoods if they think people aren't evacuating and, and try to message and so on. So um, I guess the first approach I would say is like you have one first level approach and then you see who you're missing and you figure out what the best way is to get to those people. Um, I was wondering if you have the number of Going back to your first example about Hurricane Ike, of the people who did not evacuate, what fraction actually died in that event? I suspect it's a very small number, right? Of those who died who did not evacuate. Oh, yeah, so these are people we interviewed, right. so, so none of them died. The point I'm yeah. making is that maybe being alarmist is not the best policy, the most efficient way to, effective way of getting people to evacuate, because you know, a large fraction of those who didn't die say, so well, there it is, you see, they overblow it. Right, right. So um, that's one thing, and people told us that basically. They could come back and see, well, they knew people that stayed, and some of them were in serious, unpleasant, life-threatening circumstances. Like some people were really scared and unhappy, but they were still alive. And so they could see this. I mean, one issue was that in this case, um, most people in Galveston weren't in life-threatening situations, although there was a lot of flooding. And so it, the storm surge wasn't actually as high as as it was forecasted to be in Galveston. It actually was highest somewhere else, so most of the deaths were actually outside Galveston, even among people that stayed. But I think, and but that goes to the issue of it's really hard, you know, 36 hours in advance to predict who's gonna die, like where it's gonna be the worst. And so this message was overblown, essentially. Um, but some people are totally fine with that. Like I said, some, half the people that we talked to, they knew that people who stayed didn't die, and they were still okay with the message because they, they believed that the risk was serious and that one should evacuate. And so, again, it really just depends on one's point of view. Some people think everything's overblown. They think any message is always wrong. And some people, they just believe in authority or scientists, and they just think it's all okay. So, but I think that, like you said, that's one downside of this kind of messaging is it's really hard to be accurate. The, if the full message, I mean, I, I've cut out the part where they say, if you stay and you live in a single family home right along the coast, you may die. So technically, that was a little more accurate, but that's not what gets reported in the media. No one heard that. They just heard, if you stay, you may die. A lot, people make a lot of decisions based on very small risks of dying, right? You don't need a, like a 50% chance of death to be worried. Okay, maybe we'll take one more if anybody has one. Going once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, certainly I am personally of the egalitarian mindset, but I could see where if someone was of sort of uh, lower economic means, they would feel kind of undignified to be told that they needed to evacuate or they would die if they didn't have the resources to actually do that. So I was wondering if this study is sort of normalized for the economic circumstances of the people that, that were sampled. Yeah, we did do that to the extent that we could given our survey population. So. So um, in our survey, for example, all the people that responded, you know, responded on the internet, so they have some sort of access. Now, not all of them are of high socioeconomic status, but we didn't get any homeless people, you know, so that's what the focus groups are for, is to kind of get at those different populations. So I um, mean, in, in the survey, I didn't talk about this, but one of the, um, 
barriers and constraints that we asked about was it would cost too much to evacuate. And so the results I showed are, are um, the, whether it costs too much to evacuate is an explanatory variable. It does explain why some people are less likely to evacuate, but the results I talked about are all robust given that. I think, um, I guess um, this is why I think it's important to study these things in the real world context um, in addition to kind of these abstracted contexts like I mentioned like the surveys because in the survey what we do is we treat these variables separately and really they all interact. And so people who you know, study vulnerable populations and those kinds of issues you know, know this, that it's not that you are a minority, it's not that you don't speak English, it's not that you are poor, it's not that you are an individual, it's how all these things intersect in its social and cultural context. And so if you talk to people about why they didn't evacuate, they have these very specific stories like, the same guy I mentioned who said he didn't want to evacuate to prove people wrong. He also, then he decided to evacuate because his girlfriend and his wife wanted to at the last minute, but all he had was a, like a third party check and he couldn't find a bank open to cash it so he didn't have any money. But it wasn't, if he had done it two days earlier, he would have been able to cash the check and evacuate. So there's these kind of complex, you know, situational things and, um, yeah, in the focus group after Hurricane Sandy, um, they had buses, you know, they often have buses to evacuate people. So from some of the Russian-speaking people, they got the messages in Russian, but when they went to evacuate, the bus driver only spoke English and they didn't speak English. And so they did not want to get in a bus and they, when they had no idea where they were going. And so they're kind of all, you can imagine this is an elderly Russian Jewish population. That's why they didn't want to get on those buses. And so they didn't. And so there are all these kind of complexities, right, of how all these things interact. But yes, those things are all very important. Okay, why don't we leave it there and thank Rebecca and uh, thank you all for coming.